The following broadcast is brought to you by the friends and partners of Revival Ministries International. said the tabernacle of God is with men. The day you realize that he's come and he makes his home in you, you'll act different. You'll walk different. You'll talk different. Everything will be different. As long as you see him far away, you always be trying to reach him. But when you realize he come and make his home in you, then everything changes. There's many people praying for what God's already done. Because the cross was sufficient to pave the way for Pentecost, which would complete it. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Lord, anoint every ear to hear and every heart to receive, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want you to take your Bibles this morning and I've titled this as you heard the word of the Lord that came revival in the church, revival in the floor, revival in the balconies, revival in the bathrooms, revival in the, in, in the pavilion, revival in the parking lot. So I've called this revival in me, revival in me. And I want you to go to John chapter seven, if you would please. And I want to read verse 37. In the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly or innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now, you can see in the word of God that the Holy Spirit is spoken of as water, living water, rain, wind, fire, oil. And when that fire came into my room back in March the 17th in the early hours of the morning, and it was a uh, whirlwind of fire that came straight towards me, when it went into me, it, was, it, it licked like water. So it was fire, but it was, it was like water. So I totally understand this. He said that he that believed on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus comes to save you, John 4, it will be in you a well springing up to everlasting life. That's salvation. But then John 7 is a step further, and that's the baptism in the Holy Ghost, which you can read all about that in Acts chapter 2, and you need to activate that. Now, um, I'm going to give you a very shortened version, and my wife's going to give you a shortened version, really of our testimony, how we got the condensed milk. All right. Because it's very important to, to realize your testimony is what's going to carry you. And you can see the lady from New Jersey is never going to be the same again. I mean, it's just, she's, I mean, realize that. She's, she's had a transformation. And I know, I know people have heard my testimony before, but there's new people here and there's new people tuning in by way of television. So this is very important. I gave my life to Jesus when I was five years old and was baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was eight. And growing up in Pentecost, I saw everything and I saw preachers that had an anointing and I saw preachers that didn't have anything. And I knew that God had called me into the ministry, that even though I had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit 
and had the Lord speak to me in an audible voice and many supernatural things happened as a kid growing up. I knew when the Lord was moving, I knew when he wasn't, that I knew that if I was going to go into the ministry, I had to have the firepower that was necessary. Otherwise, all I would end up being was a talking head. And there's many talking heads. As we always say, some people are called, some people are sent, others bought a microphone and went. And so that's just the way things are. And so I began to press into the Lord, and it really took a series of events. My oldest brother passed suddenly in August of 1978, and he died. It was a devastating thing for our family. And I remember standing at his deathbed, and I made a vow, the devil will pay for this. And I didn't even know what I was saying. I said, people are going to laugh at you all over the world. I, I told the devil, you made a big mistake here touching my brother, and people are going to laugh at you all over the world. I didn't know God would give me a ministry of joy. Now, you fast forward to Kelly when my daughter died 20 years ago, and on Christmas Day, I made another vow. I said, this is going to cost you 100 million souls and a billion dollars in the world missions. So we're already at, I believe, at 45 million decisions worldwide. And the other is being released through the 300 millionaires that we're raising up here that's a part of this ministry, but the devil's going to pay. So somebody said, were well, you far out there? I said, yeah, well, you weren't in the intensive care unit of the Tampa General Hospital in the early hours of Christmas morning. So somebody said, well, you really are kind of out there. I am, and I don't plan to come back anytime soon <laughs> until until the mission is accomplished. Because my commitment is not between me and somebody else, it's between myself and the Lord. I, I made a vow to him. So anyway, if I go back to July of 1979, I, I, it took from August of 78 to 79 to just get to the place of total desperation. Like really, were you willing to just surrender everything? And, you know, somebody said, well, our Lord, I surrender. But they don't really surrender, you know. It's what we talked about Friday night at the consecration service. People, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Billy Graham actually said, he said, the problem with the living sacrifice, it always calls off the altar. So people come forward to an altar, make a commitment to God. But the moment they're in the parking lot, is already gone. And that's just the practice of religion. And I didn't want that. I, I said, Lord, I have to have your power. I have to have your fire. Well, um, I was working with a, um, uh, with a whole group in the area of the Transkai, and I actually was the head of Youth for Christ uh, in, that, in that region. And we went up for the big, uh, there was a big conference in South Africa, which I actually now only realized what it was, it was the actual start of the dismantling of apartheid, that I was actually a part of that whole thing when we, I was only 18 years at the time. And it was the Sackler Conference up in Pretoria, and we were living an hour away, and we were on the bus, and all these kids were driving through, and um, there's a bunch of girls from a high school in Grahamstown. So I hung out with them, because yeah, I mean, that's what you do when you're 18, you know? Amen. <laughs> uh, Anyway, don't look at me like that, but that's just what the 18-year-old does. They were all from Anglican High School. And uh, so anyway, we were on the bus and we are talking and stuff like that. And I don't know what happened and what was the trigger that actually just made me decide that that was the day that I was going to receive from heaven. It was like a most unlikely place in a bus loaded with kids. And we're driving back to the campgrounds. And I just said, well, I told him, well, let's just start to pray. And so I start to pray, and I start shouting, which you don't do around Anglican kids, you know what I mean? And everybody prays, it's always like a quiet decorum, you know, that kind of stuff. And at the top of my lungs, I start shouting. And I'm not going to replicate it because I don't want to frighten anybody here, like our brother did from Africa. But <laughs> I, because it is scary when somebody does it, but I shouted, God, I want you fire. Well, I probably frightened every one of those people. And I, start, I started to shout. I was like it, was, it was like a hunger, desperation in my heart that I had to have, I had to have. And this was a process that took place from August, September, October, November, December of 78, and then January, February, March, April, May, uh, June, and this is now July of 79. So it wasn't just like an overnight thing where you decide 
I'm going to, this was a whole process of God doing a work on the inside. Some of you are going to have to get hungrier. Some of you, you know, I'm not trying to put it off in the future. I'm going to have to get really hungry to let God to say, I want the, what the woman from New Jersey had. Now, why would a woman who'd never been there, doesn't know anything, she walks in there and she gets everything. It doesn't even seem fair. When other people have been around here for years and never got anything or a little bit, you got a dripping of condensed milk. But God wants to make you a condensed milk supplier. Amen. God wants to make you a condensed milk um, dispenser that you can dispense it wherever you go. That's what the whole purpose is here. Some of you say, I don't want to be a dispenser. I'm retired. Well, it's not about you, just about you. Obviously, you're going to get blessed. It's about you blessing everybody else and, and, and making a mark between now and the time that you go home to be with Jesus, that you touch many people's lives. Amen. 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 Anyway, so I shouted, nothing happened. I shouted some more, nothing happened. I probably shouted about 20 minutes and blew my voice out. So my voice went hoarse. And I always jokingly say, I almost got on the horse and rode away, you know. But as I was shouting, it was like a suddenly. It was like, and I describe it, she talked about thick. It was like hot oil that came on me. It was like, it was like thick honey that was poured on me. And I felt it come right from the top of my head all the way down to my feet. And instantaneously, I was, this joy was bubbling out. And I was laughing, I was crying, and speaking in tongues all at the same time. So if you looked at me, you think I was happy, some people think I was sad, and some people think I was mad. You know, he's, he's, so I'm laughing, I'm crying, I'm speaking other tongues, and this just rolled out, and then it started hitting these girls. They all started getting baptized in the Holy Ghost. So when we pulled up at the campgrounds, I just started laying hands on everybody. Bodies were lying all the way down the bus, down into the grass out there. I got out there, totally wrecked everything. Uh, amongst the denominational people, you know what I mean? Just like, who is this kid? Whatever's going on? And this fire was on me, and it didn't lift, and it was there for a day and two days. And in the third day, I wasn't praying anymore because I said, God, send your fire. I said, Lord, either you come down and touch me or I'm coming up there to touch you. And of course, God can arrange that any time he wants to. But I, I wanted him to touch me so badly. And then, then the fire hits me. I think I'm going to die. I will die now today. So now I'm not praying for the fire anymore. Say, oh God, just lift it, Lord. Lord, don't take it away, but just lift it just so I can bear it. Because I was just totally beside myself, you know, like a couple other people I've seen around here in the last week or so. Amen. Amen. And so... Thankfully, the Lord lifted it. It stayed lightly for about two weeks. I was conscious of his presence. And then January the 1st of 80, I went to the ministry. And then God started teaching me about the anointing and what, was, what he put on me and put in me and how to minister to people. And you can get my book on the anointing. It, it describes everything. And so um, my biggest thing, obviously, was to get people saved, always. And that's my number one purpose in my life is to reach a lost and dying world with the gospel, which to my critics, I know that's hard for them to swallow, but it doesn't really matter. We'll see when we get to heaven. And that's all I can say. That, that, that's the first thing. My second thing was to get people touched with the fire of God the way I got touched with the fire of God. Because I know that once you get a touch from God, it's not about the person anymore. It's not about a person or a preacher once you realize, like I said earlier, that he's on the inside of you, then you look to the greater one on the inside of you, and that God will come and touch you in your home. Anyway, you can be in a remote place, and the power of God comes in, God speaks to you, lead you, guide you, and then you walk around, and you made a blessing unto many. Are you with me? So this is so important. So we, of course, um, thankfully, the Lord, I, I, I did that year of ministry there, um, and wrecked that whole denomination with the power of God. I mean, uh, Youth of Christ used to be totally Baptist. They were ruined. They became charismatic, Pentecostal after that. I, I, ripped, I ripped it to shreds. I'm sorry if you're watching this in South Africa, but from that 
time of 1980, Youth for Christ was never the same again. And I, my condolences to all the Baptists that were very upset about that. I do apologize. We'll have a few minutes of silence on for that for you. Just do that right now. Okay, that's about as much <laughs> silence we're going to do about that. So, and then of course, 1981, the Lord blesses me with this wonderful lady over here. And so we, yeah, so we start off traveling and we, we saw, we saw smatterings of God moving. There were, there were, there were many, many times I don't have time to get into that today, but we saw, we saw signs of the Lord doing what he had done back with me. And we saw that in meetings. We just thought maybe it was a rare occurrence. I remember one meeting, 1983, in Cape Town. And um, I, uh, who, um, she was on the front row, the pastor and his wife, and I was standing on the platform and I lifted my hands and a wind came from behind me and blew the whole place out of the power. That was 1983 and I was standing there holding onto the podium. So I can tell you, which again, frightens a minister. Oh my God, you're losing control of the congregation. I, it's got nothing to do with me. I didn't, I'm not the source of the wind. I just raised my hand and the wind came from behind me and nearly blew me out. She went out, the pastor and his wife went out. And there are many other stories that we talk about on the journey. So fast forward, the Lord, laid on our heart to come to America as missionaries. So we come over, I came over in 87. I made two missionary journeys. I made one in April of 87 to test the waters, came back in July, tested the waters. Then I went home, got rid of everything, gave much everything away, took my wife, my kids, four suitcases. Kenneth was seven months old. Stand up, son. He was seven months old when we came and landed here December of 1987. So now the whole of that year of 88, we here, major ministries had collapsed. We didn't realize there was a major economic problem in America at the time. We thought America was the land of milk and honey, which it still is, with the best place on the place of the, of the earth. Uh, wherever you go, I've traveled 88 countries, still the finest place at this juncture. They're doing their best to destroy it, but God's not finished with America yet. And there are more than 50 righteous, can you say amen? So we, we begin to cry out that God would come and move. And I'm talking about the whole of 88, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December, driving across, praying, oh God, do whatever, do we don't care, just come touch your people. And then January, February, March of 89, the same thing. April 89, upstate New York, on a Tuesday morning, the glory of God comes in like a wave of the sea. The power of God hits the place. Bodies begin to fall out under the power and people begin to, uh, you know, show signs of excessive condensed milk and <laughs> great joy. People falling out under the power, people weeping, overcome by the presence of God. And I'm just standing there. I had to hold on to the podium and people that were just caught away by the Spirit of God. Anyway, that week, the revival broke out. People were jammed into this place. I mean, I have pictures of it, a building that could hold 400 people. When we started off, probably 180 on Sunday morning, by Friday night was jam-packed. And then we thought, okay, well, this is an unusual week. The Lord's just blessing us because we've been faithful and we've served Him. And the next place we went, the same thing happened. The next place, the same thing happened and just began to pick up momentum throughout 89 and then 1990, we went back to Southern Africa. Everything God does with us, he does back in Africa first. The first extended revival took place in Pine Town and then Natal province, four week revival. We were pulling up to the church and we, the cars were lined up. We couldn't get people and we thought, who, who they got speaking here? Maybe they've invited another speaker and they never told us. And when we walked inside, they told us to speak. We thought, oh, we the speaker. We didn't realize, you know, because we, the crowds were just coming. And that was four weeks there. And then we moved to another venue. And then we moved to another venue. We went to Cape Town. That's where I met these precious people. The power of God hit in Cape Town. I mean, hundreds of people were saved, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Ghost, bodies falling out under the anointing. That was 1990, be before some of you were even born, you know. I mean, this goes back over a century now. No, it goes back to the last century. And so, <laughs> anyway, and so 
this, this whole thing began to pick up momentum. And Adonica, who is very, you know, you, you, you see her now, but she's very, she was very shy, still bold. I mean, I still watch and pull up some of the clips from her in, well, in the early days. I mean, she was, she's a strong lady. Yeah, I got the brunt of the strength of that. You know, fortunately now I'm turning it, I'm, I'm pointing her towards, you know, doing, no, I mean, she's just powerful, you know, but she's a very strong lady. She's not, she's not a pushover. You better, you better have your facts together and you better know what you're doing if you're going to convince her to do anything. And I've been able to do that for nearly 42 years. So <laughs> the Lord has been good to me. Can you say amen? But she watched all of what was happening and she actually said, I couldn't ever do that. I mean, look at those people. They must be extroverted people. But she began to find out that it wasn't just extroverted people, that it was actually some of the most introverted people that were getting covered in condensed milk and the joy was hitting them. And the pastor said, that's the most concern. I've never seen that usher. I've never seen that businessman. I've never seen anybody touch like that. So anyway, Svetlana, if you come join me here, because I want to... To, uh, we're cutting this down to an abbreviated version of everything because it's, you know, can you bring me the mic, guys? And so, because this is important, I want you to hear, uh, some people never heard my testimony and you didn't know her testimony. So she was crying out and she, my wife is not somebody that can put anything on. So if I told her that, hey, do this, she's not doing anything. If I said, hey, just pretend, she won't pretend. She, my wife is a genuine. She's no fake or nothing. She, does, she doesn't pretend to nothing. What you see is the real deal. There is nothing fake on her from there to there. Everything is the real, genuine article. Amen. Just say, that's all I want to say about that. But so she's not going to put on. She's not going to put on to save me. She's not going to put on anything to, to whatever. She just she look at you like that. So she wanted God to touch her. She said, if this is real, then I want this. And we can give you all the scripture, which we're not going to give you right now, because we obviously, I wanted to get this testimony out to you. So Sweto, tell them what happened. So from the time that I first got born again when I was 17, I, I used to press into the Lord in the worship um, just to worship the Lord. I'd close my eyes and it's like I was standing before, I could see the throne of God. Forget about everybody else, and I would worship. And it was in those moments that the fire, nobody even laid hands on me, the fire of God came down on me. I fell down in my seat, and I felt Jesus' arms wrapped around me, and I felt his unconditional love. And at the same time, he was cleaning me out. He was dealing with things in my life that I had to let go of, that I, that I had to give to him. And... Um, and it was, it was amazing. It was just, it was, the presence of God is so, it's, it's just, it's awesome because under that presence of that love and he's putting his arms around you and loving on you and he's doing that work in you and there's no condemnation or judgment. It's like, you know, the Lord's like, I, I need you to get rid of this. Like, you want it? Oh, you, how about it? You want this too? Do you want this too? You know, it's like when they got generous in the book of Acts, when they got baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire and they started giving all their stuff away. It's like you want to give all your stuff away that's on the inside of you that you're hanging on to too, because sometimes we're spiritual hoarders, you know, as well as hoarding stuff. Anyways, but the Lord would do this work to me, and I would just weep and weep and weep, and I'd be weeping, but I would, it, I wasn't sad. It just, it felt so, it was awesome, such a pre sweet presence of the Lord. And so when we, you know, my, my natural tendency is to be kind of introverted and quiet, watch people. Not come out, you know, I had to change the way I function in America because everybody wants to lay hands on you because they think you're depressed because you're quiet. <laughs> anyway, and, um, but when, when no, I would see, I mean, I'd be we in, would be with other pastors. She's sitting there quietly and they can, can we pray for your wife? She's so depressed. She wasn't depressed. She wanted to punch people. <laughs> she was just quiet. And the only, she would say, the only reason I'm quiet because I think you're an idiot. No, no, so she, but they said, oh, your wife's depressed. She actually wasn't. She was happy. She just didn't want to be there amongst weirdos. So, uh, <laughs> anyway, um, you know, when, when uh, we, we were in some churches where 
they would go running around the room and everybody's waving their hankies and stuff and getting all excited. And, and, um, and even when people genuinely would, you know, get hit with the fire of God and run around the room, I mean, I was the one digging my nails in the chair because I am not making the spectacle of myself and I am not running around the room and I'm not going to draw attention to myself. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was even difficult for me to get up and speak in front of people. It was not my, not what I wanted to do, right? But thank you, Jesus. I mean, when you see the boldness now, that's, that's all what God has done in my life. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because he would ask me to get up and I'd be like, no. <laughs> anyway, so, so we get here, we're praying for the church here, you know, for the Lord to touch them. And then we start praying for ourselves, Lord, just do a work in our heart. We don't want to stand in your way, right? So we, we're pressing in. And then the power of God falls in upstate New York. I, I don't know what happened that morning. I don't know if he shared his test. I still don't know what he, what he said, but it, it hit everybody like it hit him in 1979. And um, so I, I wasn't at the service that morning. I came that night. I see these people rolling on the floor laughing. And I'm thinking, well, I, I, I know it's genuine. And I, the presence of God was so thick and, and, and strong. I knew they were getting touched. But I thought that they were just laughing because they were extroverted personalities. And I cry when the Lord touches me because I'm an introverted personality. And then as we went along, as Pastor Rodney said, we started seeing people getting smacked everywhere we went. And we, we weren't telling them what happened in the last place. We were just talking about the Holy Spirit. And the same joy hit in Connecticut, university students in a Bible school, Zion Bible, Bible Institute. And... Um, and we're just watching the Lord do this. And, and uh, we were as amazed as everybody else. I mean, happy amazed, right? Uh, and seeing, seeing people, the altar calls, you know, people came running to be saved. And um, it's just healed in the services and marriages put back together. All kinds of miracles and fruit that we were seeing from this. And, and, uh, and I'm seeing now, hearing the testimonies of very shy people, very dignified people, um, people that, that I identified with, yeah, they are rolling on the floor making an exhibition of themselves. You see, when I saw people do that, I thought, I'm not doing that. I don't want to make it. I wanna, if, I, if that happened to me, I'd be so embarrassed, right? Rolling on the floor laughing. And anyways, and so um, I'm starting to see now, wait a minute, these people getting hit with the fire of God. One lady couldn't even speak in English for two weeks I mean, there was, they own six jewelry stores. They're business people. They're, they're, they're respected in the community. And she's rolling. She, stuck, she was actually stuck on the floor the entire day from the morning till the night and then couldn't speak in English for two weeks. And her, her husband got saved because of it. I mean, she walked in the door and he hit the ground speaking in tongues and he had refused to go to church before then. But anyways, so you know, I'm when, when we say she couldn't speak in English, she was so overcome by the Spirit of God, she would take a pad and write what she wanted in English. But she couldn't speak for two whole weeks. And, uh, Under and, the anointing. and then everybody she would pray for would get hit by the fire of God, right? So, um, so I see this and I'm like, okay, this is real. I guess I need it. But I'm like, Lord, I'm not going to make it, you know, again, not wanting to make an exhibition of myself. I'm, it has to be real. I'm not laughing because everybody else is laughing. It has to be real. And um, so I said, okay, Lord, you do whatever you want to do. So I start pressing in. And every service, uh, you know, when Pastor Rodney would say, everybody, stand up, lift your hands, put your eyes on Jesus, and let the Lord touch you, uh, I stood up, raised my hands, put my eyes on Jesus, said, Lord, touch me. And over the course of six months, the Lord was doing a work in me and touched me in, in different services. And I, I would just, again, weep and weep. The one time he prayed, he laid hands on me, and I, I was on the floor. I got up half an hour later, and then they told me, no, it's not half an hour later. It's two and a half hours later. But it felt like half an hour to me. And I, it, I wasn't laughing or crying or anything like that, but I was, I was so, the anointing was so strong. I just, you know, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 18, don't be drunk on wine wherein is excess, but be ye being filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we use that term drunk on the Holy Spirit, not disrespectfully, but just because it means to be overwhelmed by the, by the Holy Spirit. It means to be more aware of his presence than, than of things in the natural and, you know, I'd, I'd heard people say that, but I'd never experienced that myself. And I experienced that. It's like he was more real than the, that one I could see and, and touch. And, and um, th there was such a peace on me. I, I didn't want to, you know, it's, it, the, the presence of God is holy. It's holy. And sometimes it's very difficult to put it into words. 
uh, because it, you feel it's holy and you feel your words on, on, on will not do it justice of what you feel that the Lord is doing in your heart. And um, so I just, I didn't really want to talk to anybody because I, I just wanted to stay under that morning. I just went to put myself to bed. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so six months in, we're in P Pennsylvania and I'm sitting on a Tuesday night and I'm minding my own business. I'm not even actually really like determinedly pressing in at that moment. I'm just sitting there enjoying God's presence. People are already rolling on the floor. One lady is kicking her feet in the air and she had a dress on. So all I'm thinking about is like keeping her decent while she's drunk, you know, and trying to keep her covered. And then I start feeling, which is what Pastor Rodney read, I, you know, I only connected that later, that rivers of living water springing up on the inside. And I feel this thing bubbling. It's bubbling, it's bubbling, and it gets up here, and I stopped it because I got my head involved in it, and I'm like, I'm, I'm analyzing it now and thinking about it, and I hear the authoritative, <laughs> kind, but no-nonsense voice of the Holy Spirit, and he said, stop thinking about it and just let me do it. <laughs> that's, that's a yes, sir moment, and you don't argue anymore, it's just, okay, you don't know, I didn't know what was going to happen. I had no clue, uh, and, and, but I had to shut my head off and just let God do whatever he wants to do. And uh, <laughs> because that was my problem. My head would always get involved. Like I said, Lord, touch me, but I'm like, you know, I want to be, uh, you know. You want to be dignified. I want to be, yeah. Because right before, the, this, right before this happened, I actually told the Lord, Lord, I... I <laughs> I'm the preacher's wife. I need to be dignified. <laughs> and then the fire got, you know, anyway, then people are rolling on the floor. And it's like it was the most undignified in the natural, you know. And, uh, and so, <laughs> and so I, I, I wanted the Lord to touch me, but I, I, wanted to, I wanted to keep my head in the game, right? And, uh, and so I realized after the Lord showed me, it's like I was, okay, Lord, touch me, but I'm still holding on. And as he touched me through that six months, it was like he was peeling my fingers off <laughs> the pole. And uh, <laughs> she was hanging on for dear life, <laughs> but she was losing her grip. And uh, so I'm sitting there and I feel that again, bubbling, bubbling up. And it came out of my mouth. And I'm now laughing loud. Now I want to tell you, I mean, I would. You always be louder laugh. in front you of. Used to laugh quietly. Yeah, I mean, in, with people, I would kind of. I'd always be like, you know, quiet and backward and coming forward and not even laugh loud and maybe be more relaxed with family. But here I am laughing really, really loud. I'm I'm laughing so hard. I'm crying now. I don't know how, but I ended up on my hands and knees on the floor, and I've got ladies and the tears are dripping off my nose, and I've got Kleenex up the front, and I've got the cloth at the back, and my bit of brain that was still functioning, I'm thinking about what, you know, what, what other people are thinking, or what, and I thought, well, they're probably laughing at me, maybe with me or at me, I don't know. I, I, I didn't see, but I figured my husband potentially, maybe not on the outside, but maybe on the inside was going, <laughs> because he'd never seen me like that, and, um, but you know, it was like all those other times that the Lord wrapped his arms around me. I felt, I felt that powerful presence of the Lord. I felt the presence of Jesus. And it was like all those other times he was cleaning me out. This time I felt like he was pouring something in. You know, the Bible talks about the oil and the wine. I felt like he was pouring. And I felt free when I got saved, but I felt so free that day. I felt the liberty. The Bible talks about liberty. I felt liberty. I felt free. And and. At that moment, I really didn't care what anybody else thought, which was always my problem, th worrying too much what other people thought. I didn't care what they, th what they thought because it's like Jesus and I were having such a wonderful time, and I didn't want to miss out on it, and it was so awesome. And I'm there getting touched on my hands and knees, and my Kelly and Kirsten came running. K K Kelly called Kirsten. They were in kids' church. said, come and see what's happening with mom. And Kirsten had just, Kirsten had just turned, no, Kelly had just turned, Five, I think, and Kirsten was about to turn seven because it was in October. And, um, and, and, I, I, and Kirsten's sitting on the front row, and the power of God hits Kirsten at the age of seven. She starts laughing, 
And she didn't stop. In fact, even when the service was over, we picked her up, we carried her, put her in bed, and I don't know what time, she stopped laughing. When Taylor was two years old, two years old and four months, she got hit with the fire of God and the joy in our house at one o'clock in the morning and laughed for 12 minutes. I mean, a two-year-old doesn't laugh for 12 minutes like that without you tickling them or doing something. But the, the joy hit her, was she, I don't even know if she even remembers that because she was only two years and four months. But it, it, she, she looked up at him and she went, Grandpa, it's so funny. <laughs> and we're crying and she's laughing. And, you know, this is so precious. And then it didn't, it didn't happen to me like that every service. And it wasn't something I could turn on or turn, uh, turn, off, turn off. In fact, it usually hit me when I was trying to be dignified. And we'd be in a restaurant... And he'd be telling people that have never been in the meetings, a Spanish couple, and they're just looking at me. And he's telling me, tell them what happened to you. And I'm, and I'm looking at their faces. Because you know what? There's a lot of people that look at people being drunk under the Holy Ghost and life and rolling on the floor. And they, they, they kind of laugh at them in a mocking way, like a disrespectful way, you know. And, uh, and, and they, 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 they laugh because they're being silly. But, you know. The thing is, it's like, and they think they're in the flesh. Can I tell you, that's not, I mean, when people are genuinely in touch from the Lord, it's got nothing to do with the flesh. It's about them yielding to the Holy Spirit. Some people laugh, some people cry. It's, it's like, you don't know how you're going to respond. Everybody's in a different place with the Lord. Some people have to cry before they can laugh. And, and um, some people come in wanting to laugh, and then all they do is cry. Because that's the work that the Lord is doing in them. It's, like, it's, it's about yielding. It's not about a manifestation. It's about the yielding. And that's why the testimony, the condensed milk testimony, it's very real, it's very raw, and it's very funny because it's real and genuine, right? And, um, and so, <laughs> but you know, can I tell you what? The, the flesh isn't that rolling on the floor laughing. This is the flesh. <laughs> and you know what? It's okay to be skeptical. Because you want what's real, right? I mean, I had to go and say, Lord, where is this in the Word? And, and he showed me. You know, with everything, it's got, you've got to find it in the Scripture. But, you know, there's a lot of people, they come in skeptical, and then because they, have a, they genuinely are open for the Lord to show them, God can touch them. Some people come skeptical. Some people come angry. But if they really, if they really open their heart... Some people don't want to be here. <laughs> but, you know, if... There's some people that they see, they feel the presence of God, or they see the presence of God, they see the fruit of it, right? Salvations, marriages put back together, lives put back together, and they still refuse. Then you're not a skeptic anymore, you're a cynic and you've become a Pharisee. And so, the power of God, <laughs> I'm, sitting, I'm in a restaurant, and the fire of God hits me, I'm like, and then, then it hits the whole table, when half the table's under the table, and the, 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 uh, the waiter comes in, he's like, he's looking at us, because he knows he never served anybody alcohol. <laughs> it's like, we hadn't even had food yet, he just didn't even give us water, and we're already under the table, and, 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 <laughs> anyway, so this went on for like 18 months, and then, um, and then we went to, to uh, this, uh, yeah, <laughs> to, and because, because what happened was, you know, because I was my, on my, in my, you know, you are, it's like you have a, um, and, and it, it was, uh, mine was, <laughs> and then, so when, when, when I was, you know, when it, when it, you know, it was like he, he, um, he, um, and, uh, and then, then, then it was like, like it was, you know, and then when we were in, 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 yeah, that, at that, um, and then he, um, and then I was, and he, and he, and, he, and I, I, um, and I, 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 I For, for, 
and it, when, when he, when I, and then I, um, and, and, and it's like you, 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 but, but you, but, but. <laughs> and, and it was like, it, it, it's like he, 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 uh, it's like it was, was my, 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 you know, was, was like, um, like, you know, <laughs> and it was just, just, just. Just like, like, <laughs> and then it was all. <laughs> and and it, it, it's. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and it's and it's a uh, it's it's a it's a uh, it's it's a it's a it's a and it's yeah it's it's a it's a <laughs> of of. life and it, it flows from the throne and he puts it on the inside of you and me and it's a river of living water life giving water it's a river of peace it's a river of joy <laughs> It's the oil of joy. But it 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 comes to it comes to fill up all the dry places of your life. It comes to bring a healing and restoration. And, he, and we are so privileged to carry <laughs> to to carry his river. To the world and wherever we that we go. And you can and he said to me, You can live like this. You can live. You can live free. You can live in his joy. You can live in his peace. You can live with that river of living water that bubbles up whenever you need it. You don't, you know, it's just not at one touch, one experience, but it's pressing in. If you've never been touched, you're going to be touched. If you've been touched, you're going to be filled up to overflowing. <laughs> you're going to leave changed. You're going to leave different. It's not going to evaporate. It's not going to go away. It's not going to leave you. But if you'll cultivate that, if you'll keep yielding to the Holy Spirit, if you'll keep letting him do that work in your life, how do you come into revival through repentance and humility and saying, Lord, come and do whatever you want to do. I don't know what I need. You know what I need. Do a work in me. And you just keep that attitude of just humility before God. God, touch me today. Fill me up. Use me. Burn everything out of me that's not of you. And brand Jesus in my heart. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want, I want Pastor Stacy just come. Get on the keyboards and just begin to sing. There's a sweet anointing flowing into this place. He wrote the song in 1992, traveled with us for many years. And this was the song from the early days of the revival. Just give him, make sure he's my kiss, please, guys. Get, make sure he's set up. 
Thank you, Jesus. Just close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Thank you, Jesus. There's a sweet anointing flowing into this place. Step into the water and see. He will touch you. He will change you. Fill you up to overflowing. Step in and be set free today. I'm set free through his anointing. I'm set free through his joy. I'm set free. I've been changed by his love. Cause I stepped into the water flowing down from his throne. <laughs> I'm no longer the same there's a sweet the water and sea oh he will touch you he will, he will change, change you, you, fill you up, up to overflowing. Step in and be set free today. I am set free through his anointing, set free through his joy. I'm set free, I've been changed by His love. Oh, cause I've stepped in to the water flowing down from His throne. I'm set free, I'm no longer the same. I just want everybody to bow your heads across this room. I want to give an invitation right now. You're coming to this place today. You say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But today I want to accept him and invite him into my life. I want, to take, I want him to take full control. What will happen if today was your last day on the earth? You breathe out your last breath. Where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And you don't have to go to devil's hell because 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross, the price was paid, the blood was shed. Will you surrender to him today? Maybe you say, Pastor, I've got some things that no one knows about. Pride, unforgiveness, jealousy, anger, lust, hidden things. But I want them to go from me today. Well, Pastor, I'm dealing with things that everybody knows about, and that's what makes it even worse. I want that gone. He said, I will take out the stony heart and put it in a heart of flesh. He said, a new spirit will I put within you. Will you surrender to him and say, yes, Lord? 
Maybe you hear, you say, Pastor, a storm came against my life. A sudden divorce, a bankruptcy, the loss of a loved one, a sudden illness, the betrayal of a close friend, the loss of a job. Something happened that rocked my world, shook me into the core. But today I want to come. I want to fall in love with Jesus. I want to surrender my life afresh to him. And then maybe you hear, you say, Pastor, I just, I don't know. I, I don't have the assurance. And today I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'm a child of God. If this is you and you fit into any one of these categories, I want to pray with you and for you right where you are. And the balconies and the main floor, quickly just slip your hand up and say, pray for me right now. I need Jesus. Raise your hand up right now. Just slip it up high. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you. Just slip it up high and say, yes, Lord. Today is my day of freedom and liberty. And I'm never going to be the same. I want every person with your hand raised to stand right where you are. Quickly stand. Stand up. Every person that raise your hand, just stand. Just stand. Now, if you will look at me right now, if anybody's in this section and the north balcony, you did not stand, but you want to be included. The prayer we're going to pray, quickly, stand. You say, why? Because this could be the final moment for people. This middle section and the west balcony, if you did not raise your hand, I want you quickly include you. Just go ahead and stand right now. I want to pray with you and for you. And then this section here, the south balcony, quickly just go ahead and stand and say, that's me. I'm going to ask you all to come from where you are. Come stand right here at the altar. We're going to lead you in a prayer. Come right now. flowing into this place step into the water and see he will touch you he will change you fill you up to overflowing step in and set free today I'm set free through his anointing set free through his joy I'm set free I've been changed by close your eyes and just raise your right hand to heaven. You that are watching in your homes, pray this together with us right now. Just say, Father, I come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. I will be saved. So, Father, right now, I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart right now. Take out the stony heart. Put in a heart of flesh. Wash me. Cleanse me, change me, fill me, use me. Let me never be the same again. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin. And I follow you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you that on the third day you rose for me. 
and thank you that you're coming back again for me. From this day on, I'll never be the same again. I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is my Lord and my Savior. And right now, by faith in the finished work of the cross and by the shed blood of Jesus, I'm saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me now. Now just lift both hands and begin to thank him. Father, I pray even now that you would seal them now by your blood and by your spirit, that on that day not one would be missing. Raise them up to be mighty men and women of God and use them to impact this generation, we pray. And now, Lord, just pour in the oil and the wine, the type that restores their soul. And I set them free now, and I break every bondage, every addiction, everything that has held them in captivity. I break it over their life, and I set them free now by the power of the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be the name. 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 Hallelujah. Yes. I want you to look at me right now. If you meant business with God, God means business with you. And from this very day, everything changes. Maybe not out there, but inside here. And then God begins to change the outside. Jesus first works on the inside, and then he works through you. You might go back to the same apartment, the same situation, the same neighborhood, whatever. But it's when he comes to make his home in you, and God begins to do a work in you, and he begins to use you to touch the lives of people around about you. And that's what this is all about. So this anointing is not just for myself, my wife, or the precious lady from New Jersey, or the dear brother from Africa. This anointing is for you. He said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. I want you to close your eyes and just lift your hands one more time. Let me pray for you right now. Father, would you baptize them now in the same Holy Ghost in the name of Jesus. Fill them to overflowing. Now just go ahead and just begin to speak out. Just begin to speak out. A river begins to run out of here. In the name of Jesus right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus right now. A mighty river that flows. Just speak it out right now. Trust the Holy Ghost. Receive the power. Receive the anointing. Receive it now. Receive it now. Receive it now. Yes, provoke it. And fill them now. Fill them with your joy. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it. That's it, dear brother. That's it. You have it. That's it, dear. Thank you for watching today on YouTube. Please press the subscribe button and also the notification button and like and get the word out so others can watch.